substantive things tonight. Yeah, that is true. <clears throat> I'll bring this up when we get started, but I want to view item number. Uh, hang on. Got amazing. On the truck purchase. Uh huh. On the on the solid waste truck. Yeah, the roll off unit. Uh huh. I'd like to move it off of the consent agenda. Okay. So E will move off. That would be item E. Right. Got it. Evening, gentlemen and ladies. Good evening, friend. How are y'all doing today? Doing very well, thank you. How are you? I am blessed. I'm above ground, not in the ground. Sir, that's right. I hope you're in no pain. Oh, I'm not in no pain. So, okay, good. Hey, Wes. Did y'all screen just go blank? Yes. Yeah. Oh. No, that was oh. just yours. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Can y'all not see the flags? No. Oh, okay. Let me fix that. Just a second. B Tom. <laughs> Keep my eyes open, I tell you. <laughs> see the flag. See the flag. I, I see flag. Be flagged. Uh, Be flagged. We missed our opportunity. We, we, we should have all said that, yeah, we see the flag. And Tom would be the only one that didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, Tom, when's the last time you had your eyes checked? You don't see that big flag. I get no respect. I know. I know. Real respect. <laughs> We're going to start calling you. What was that guy's name? Rodney? Rodney Dangerfield. Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, you keep saying that. We're going to call you Rodney. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you ought to hear what the other people call me. Or maybe you shouldn't. Uh, you may uh, want Rodney, huh? So are we still going to be Rodney on for there. meeting in person next me. week? Next week? Yeah, that June? Starts our are back to person meetings if we're going to do that we sure have had a lot of cases this last week have uh, and, and several I we, too i will not be available next week so by phone or in person or either um hang on let me look at my calendar so i can tell you If we started at 10 o'clock, I don't think I'll be able to do either one. What, next week? Yeah. I have grand grandkids calling. Oh. And I'm afraid Southwest will have me off the internet. <clears throat> well, very good. And uh, Tulsa, but where is it? Muskogee or oh no we're gonna go actually gonna go to the to Florida. Oh wow nice oh. Panama City Beach. Okay. Very nice. Yeah, that's my home state. What is it? Yeah, city of Jacksonville. That's yeah, we're a few miles from Jacksonville. Uh-huh. In the meeting, we've got about two more minutes in the meeting. Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Hi, you were very quiet. Oh. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I'm here. Hey, Dewey. How are y'all? Good. 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 What are you doing? Good. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Michael. Hey, 
Mike. Hey, Mike. I was talking for the last two minutes. They realized I was on mute. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think we've all done that. <laughs> Did you say anything really important? No, not a substance. No. <laughs> Times that my wife would like to have a mute button. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The mayor always sits there and watches that clock till it's six o'clock. I'm watching my computer. Watching yes. my watch. Everybody watching something. Hey, it's now six o'clock, so I'll call this meeting to order. Pray with me, please. Our most gracious God, you are the author of love and you teach us how to love. We pray now that you will fill our hearts, that we might make proper decisions, that we might make righteous decisions for, for this community. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we use that love as we go through this meeting and through the times we have ahead. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for uh, blessing us and the city with, with all that we have. In Christ's name I pray, amen. 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 Council member Shelton will lead us in the pledge. All right, you ready? Yes. All right, let's go. Honor the I'm, Texas flag. Hey. Present my legion to be. Texas. Texas. One state, one state under God, under God. Um, and one indivisible. 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 And now for the uh, pledge, the American pledge, I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of, the of the United, United States, States of America. America and to the Republic, the Republic for which, is, which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God, indivisible, indivisible. With liberty, liberty and, and justice for all. Justice for all. Thank you. Okay, we have some proclamations, awards, and presentations. I think first up is uh, Patton with uh, Parks and Recreation on a uh, side opening. Steve? Uh oh. Can y'all hear me? We got you. Yeah. You got you. You got you? Okay. All right. All right. So I want to make sure. sure. I'm, I'm on, on a video, video as well as on the phone call, so, so it should, should be coming in, in on stereo. Like stereo. <laughs> <laughs> from every it's direction. In it's kind of like surround sound. <laughs> uh, I did want to give an update on where we are with our parks and uh, the reopening. I know there's been a lot of controversy as far as uh, our swimming pools and, and spray grounds. A lot of questions, a lot of phone calls today from the public. But we do have everything is noted on our website as far as what we have opened. And I, I want to add that we're staying right in compliance with what the governor's orders, executive orders, has sta stated. We will be opening on June 1st our community buildings at 50%, and we'll start reservations at that time. We'll note to every single person that contacts us to make a reservation. There will be information online and at the if they want to make online reservations that they must comply with 50% of the building capacity. That capacity will be noted on the registration information with a note that they have to sign that they understand that they shall not go over that 50% building capacity. Uh, picnic pavilion rentals will also start on June the 1st. We have a lot of people that are calling that want to have graduation parties in the buildings as well as at the picnic pavilions. We're asking as um, if they do rent one of our picnic pavilions that they do observe 
the, uh, the social distancing practices, that, and um, we will insist on that, and then uh, we hope that they will comply with that. I know there's going to be some big groups of people that are going to be having their graduation uh, parties at the parks, especially at the pavilions. Uh, playgrounds like Midland, we opened on May the 22nd. We also opened the skate park on May the 22nd. Uh, our big attendees are, of course, youth and adult sports programs. That was mandated by the governor and, and his phase two operations. May 31st is when uh, the participants can start practice with one person as a spectator. Competitive games can start June the 15th. Now, I've contacted each one of the associations and had noted to them that this is the situation uh, as mandated by the governor. Uh, all are, of course, uh, at this point going to uh, be in compliance and, and start their practices. Football said that uh, they might start a little bit later because what they're finding is low participants. The parents won't let their kids play in some of the sports, and some of the programs are suffering with, with attendees. I have noted that in the event that anything that is that affects the increase in our significant numbers of the COVID cases, that at a moment's notice that we could uh, close the facility, cancel their reservations, and they would get a full refund for any uh, rental funds that they've paid up front. But um, it is, in, and I've made a statement that it's in their best interest that we have. Uh, everybody's best entrance in health, safety, and welfare uh, is top priority. Now, the only facilities that really do remain closed is the spray grounds, and the governor refers to those as spray pads. I've noticed in his correspondence and in his executive orders, he did release another executive order today made, making a statement that water parks are going to be able to open, and, uh, but I did not see anything specific to our spray grounds. So McKinney and UTPB remain closed. That leaves our swimming pools. And uh, what I've found throughout the entire state, that there is uh, so many different um, positions on opening the pools. Uh, what we found across the state is, especially those areas that have uh, or, uh, a hot spot or if they're concerned about a growing number of the COVID cases, they don't plan to open. What I found uh, I thought was a good solution that one community is waiting to see when the governor is going to come out with phase three, and if the bather load, participant load, is raised to 50 percent. Right now, outdoor swimming pools are at 25 percent capacity, which means our big aquatic centers would only be at about 140 to 150 people. Uh, Midland, I've had several discussions with them. They do plan to open, but one of their big problems is they can't find staff. They need 32 people to operate one of their pools, and right now they're at 14, and they don't have any more applicants. And UIL is going to be starting on June the 8th, and with UIL starting back up, that means all the kids that are in band, football, other sports are going to be off to start practice. Coaches are usually our managers, and it's a big concern because they would be participating in UIL events also. So no doubt everyone is going to have a difficult, difficult problem in staffing uh, needed personnel at the aquatic facilities. Uh, the, um, I thought one thing that, like I had mentioned, one thing that was of interest that I thought was a, a neat position to be on and to respond to the public, what, when they're looking at a 50% uh, capacity, now you're talking 300 people at our pools, and that's a significant amount of people. What they were seeing is the expense the trouble at 25% capacity is just not worth the time is what some of these cities are saying and I thought was a good position. At 50%, then you can make better accommodations if the governor is going to make that decision in phase three. But they also noted that they cannot staff the pools, get everything up and running past June the 15th. If the governor comes out after that date and says that pools can be at 50%, they're not going to open the rest of the summer because of UIL, possibly schools starting earlier, and the, the uh, difficulty of getting staff. So we're at a real unique position, and uh, still my recommendation because of, I think, increased cases that we're, we're experiencing, 
and uh, the difficulty and, and as well as the cost to make the accommodations, uh, still my recommendation that we remain closed this summer. And I didn't know if there was um, any concerns, comments that the council had had. I know um, our, our phones have been ringing today with a lot of people asking questions and making note. Uh, Andrews is open. Make note, Odessa. And uh, <laughs> I think every city has got their own, own standing on what they're going to do with their swimming pools or not. Okay, so right now, basically, our, our swimming pools are still open. I mean, still closed. And That's correct would be unless potentially the governor went into phase three before June 15. And, but if not, then after that, it would be almost impossible if it's not already impossible. Is that kind of the summary of what you're saying? It's going to be difficult. We can open now at 25% capacity, but that would only, we could only accommodate about 140 to 150 people. And like Midland, um, with their short staff and, and the limited capacity, they're actually just going to open and, and uh, one pool and then have it open for about three days, close it, go to the next pool, open it for two or three days. And during the daytime, they're going to run people in shifts, like a two- to four-hour shift, and then those people have to evacuate and let the next group come in. And they're going to have extra personnel to keep everybody uh, in line outside with the social distancing and and uh, that's that's a real difficult management situation. It makes it really tough on everybody. We have a lot of kids that just are dumped out by their parents and we're babysitters all day. And uh, it's really, I think it's gonna be the social distancing issue is really that and, and uh, constant cleaning and is gonna be our biggest job to tackle and as well as finding staff. But I thought a good position. I'm sorry. If we, it, I thought a good position. I, I did like the idea of um, when they were when the other cities, a couple of these cities, just made note. You know, if we're going to provide a service, we want to provide something that's going to be worthy, and uh, that's why they said 50% capacity is going to be providing a service that's going to be worthy to the public as well as worth our effort to open and go to that much trouble. And I said, well, that that is a good position to take if we're going to need to take one, but with with the difficulty of staff, the cost. And uh, the, the potential, I think, of our numbers going up, I'm, I'm very concerned about all of the above to stay closed this year. So, Steve, what, what was the final agreement with that management company we were going to have, the pool management, that they'd given us sort of a timeline that if we didn't hire them by certain dates? Are you talking about if we do open, we're going to do it with our own staff? No, we we would still go through the management because they do have the resources. They've got a, a team of people to to activate everything in a, a proper manner, and they also have $10 million worth of insurance uh, in the event that uh, there is anything that, that's going to happen. I, I do like their, their insurance coverage and the liabilities that are associated with um, everything that would be going on in, in such a rush order, but um, they are including – more fees because of the additional cleaning and uh, the effort that it would take for them to maintain the CDC regulations that have been placed on them that they feel that would be appropriate. Also, they've, um, and I can see why, with anticipated loss of revenues compared to our normal attendance levels, that's where they have, they're looking at about another $100,000 be uh, on top of their regular regular fee that they wanted to negotiate. So, so there's yeah, go ahead. There's definitely some costs involved, okay. budget impact. Okay, Deetra. With that being said, Steve, and and I don't disagree with you at all. Are you coming up with a plan for next year? Uh, we've already told them we're we're ready to go for next year. What, you know, would that, be, what would make the difference? What would make the difference? Yeah. We're, I'm counting on the vaccine between now and then, I hope. Okay. And if that's not the case, I think we'll need to look. I mean, we'll have to analyze it as we go through the wintertime. Uh, uh, hopefully, we won't have a huge wave. I think we're just going to have to monitor the situation and uh, and see. I, just, I hope that it's diminished and we have a vaccine or we have 
treatment and and uh, and have a comfort zone that we feel comfortable to open everything. You know, one as well thing as that, staff. Yeah, one thing that I think we're going to have to consider also is this company, if uh, if they come in, and I know this is too much in the future, but you know, wanting to charge us a hundred thousand dollars more, you know, like they're proposing for this year, then they may not be the company that we can go with. And so are you prepared to look at some other alternatives, including Parks and Rec? Sure. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I don't disagree with you for this summer. I don't like it, but I don't disagree with you. And, uh, but, you know, at, at some point we need our pools, you know? If it's not this year, then hopefully we'll have a better opportunity for next year. But um, anyway, just a thought. Any other questions for Steve? I had a, a question, I guess it's a question. Steve, um, listening to a medical center today, Dr. Sarah Bannon was stating that a lot of our recent increase was from family gatherings and in light of that, when people rent the park buildings and we know that you tell them 25%, they're mostly on the weekends. Are we going to know what happens? I mean, he's, he's, he's said from contract, contact tracing, it's been determined that family gatherings are where our increases are coming from at this point. And so those will be family gatherings. Are we monitoring, you know, the weekends or? What are our plans? Now, I think all we can do is just make a strong statement that okay. that we insist on that. that I don't have the personnel, and if the what think we're so. finding, you know, to really go around and monitor, and, and then we don't, then um, you know, our personnel, we don't have any. I don't know that we have any authority, and I know we don't have police um, available to assist with such security measures, but um, right. well, it's just really kind of curious. Just, just listening to him today, it just kind of made me think, oh my gosh, you know, since that's where he, he and the hospital and the staff have determined, you know, that most of our recent cases are coming from his family gatherings. So just, just a concern. And, you know, just, just ask whoever's explaining to him to please, please, you know, reemphasize that that they really need to follow those guidelines. They they really, really do. We're gonna have a separate sheet for them to sign. Oh, I, okay. I just hope that, that that when they when they rent a the facility, they're gonna have to sign a special sheet with those guidelines uh, stated and especially if it's a building, they right. have to maintain it at um the certain percentage that at that point. Uh, okay. it, it's a great concern and, and uh um, of even more concern is uh, the comments that I get from people. They just don't think it's real. Yeah, I agree. And, I, I, and, uh, I totally agree. I'm, so Steve, I'm really surprised. I guess, I guess at this point, Steve, we're just we're just on hold, assuming we're probably not going to open the pools. But if any if anything changes via the governor's orders, or are you change? Uh, you have a change of mind then you will just come back to us, I guess, since we're meeting basically every week. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. If there's absolutely, if there's a complete change and we go, we look like we need to go to another direction. I mean, I, uh, I'll be in touch with Philip and Michael and we will get in touch and okay. you know, announce everything. But uh, I, it, right now the, the game plan is to stay closed and uh, protect, protect everybody. It's the children. And as I've stated, <clears throat> to a person I was arguing with this situation a couple of days ago, the parents can take the responsibility of themselves, and if they, they're making those decisions, and grown-ups can – and they can have their own ideas, and they can be accountable for their own decisions. But when we have a situation and there's children involved, and when parents drop their kids off at our aquatic facilities and expect us to be the babysitter for the day, and the children have no responsibility, they're going to be – Real young, they don't know what six feet is as far as social distancing, and right. as I stated, that's our tomorrow, and and uh, we need to protect our kids 
and and uh, in the best interest of the of the children and okay. see what we can do to uh, to make sure that they stay safe and healthy and let's revisit this thing next year. Okay, well, thank you so much for all you all are doing and all the calls you're having to field. I'm sure there's oh, a- No problem. <laughs> and thanks, Steve. No and I know your staff will go over that. I know the pools are important, but that social gathering is equally as important. So thank you for making sure that they understand that statement that they sign and that they will do their best to abide by it. Yes, it, we've just got to depend on, on their participation. Right. Um, it's, okay. it's so difficult for us to police it. All right, thank you, Steve. Thank you. Uh -huh. Do we have Chief Huber? Yes, I'm here. Hi, thank you in advance for all you all are doing as well. Yes, ma'am. I think you are, you're going to tell us uh, about the uh, recognition to the, of the Odessa Fire Rescue for the American Heart Association, right? Sure, I can do that, you bet. Uh, the American Heart Association has an accreditation for cardiac care and specifically STEMI care, uh, which, is, which is a heart attack. And uh, Odessa Fire Rescue achieve the 2020 Mission Lifeline EMS Gold Plus Award for the second year in a row. Wow. We've gotten, we've gotten gold awards and silver awards and bronze awards in the past. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the highest award you can get uh, for a fire EMS agency for cardiac pre-hospital care. Uh, we are very proud of this award. This is, we are the only one to get this award in the Permian Basin, uh, but not only the Permian Basin, but our whole regional advisory council. So that extends from Terlingua, Presidio, Seminole, Big Springs. It's a really big area and uh, it's, it's not easy to get, but we've got phenomenal paramedics, uh, phenomenal equipment. Uh, our 12 lead recognition that we can submit to both ERs where we transport. And uh, it's just, it's not just Chief Huber or Chief Alvarez saying we were one of the best in the state of Texas. This is the American Heart Association saying we are one of the best fire EMS agencies in the nation. And so I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. We're proud of that. And I wanted to get that out there. Thank you so much. And, you know, we, we all know that and we feel so proud for everything that the Odessa Fire Rescue is doing is particularly yeah. all of the testing and all that you've done through this pandemic. So, but it's always nice to get outside accolades as well. So congratulations to you and the entire Odessa Fire Rescue. Thank you. Thank you very much on behalf of all of Odessa Fire Rescue. Uh, we appreciate your support. Any questions from Chief Huber? Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you, sir. You bet. Thank you, sir. Okay, next we have Dr. Perryman and uh, some of us heard him uh, give his report to the ODC group. And uh, we had really bad connections and it was kind of hard to hear some of it. So. We have asked him uh, to once again come back and kind of give us a summary of what his report said. I know we're, we're fairly familiar with it, but there's nothing like right from him. So, uh, Dr. Perryman, are you with us now? I am here, absolutely. And uh, no reverberation, we can hear you. <laughs> That's great. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, I, 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 and thanks, Peggy. Thanks to all of you for, for this opportunity and for everything you're doing uh, for the for the city in this very very difficult time. Um, I will. I, I see the slideshow is actually up and running today too. So there's a lot of things that are different today, and that's good. Uh, I will go through that fairly quickly. But uh, before I get into the actual slides, I'd like to just make a, a couple of overall comments about about uh, the uh, the analysis that we did. As we started off, we were looking more at things like what can we do immediately to the situation 
and very quickly, uh, various groups in town, ODC and, and, and others came together very quickly to do those things. And so uh, we, we have some of that information in there, but that's really the kind of stuff that we and other communities around Texas were already doing. As, as Wes and I talked about a scope and that sort of thing, it sort of morphed into some, <clears throat> some bigger picture items uh, that are near term and very important, uh, but also kind of are a segue into some of the future initiatives like Opportunity Odessa and other things that are going on right now. And in, in essence, basically, I'll, I'll walk through some things, but two essential messages that I think need to get out there. One of them is to our local workforce and to some extent our local businesses, as, as it's very, very important that we that we do everything we can to keep our structure together uh, so that as the demand for oil comes back and, and the price of oil comes back, which, which I don't think will take too long, then uh, we have that infrastructure in place so we can so we can move very quickly. We haven't dismantled everything. And and one big part of that message I think is and it's something that I've, I've talked to a couple of groups about locally and I wrote a column about it this week statewide. And that is that uh, that this is not the nineteen eighties. And and I'll say a little bit more about that at the end of the slideshow. It's a very important key fundamental differences that make this an entirely different time because <clears throat> Goodness gracious, when you just sit back and look at what happened the last month or so, it certainly feels like the 1980s. But, but there's a lot of things going on that, that, it's not, that make it very different, and those are very important differences. I want to highlight that. And the other one is that, uh, that just really how, how important the Permian Basin is to, to Texas and to the United States, and, and recommending an advocacy program. And there's already a task force underway, which we suggested trying to get this going. I think it can happen pulling in some other resources, but we really have to tell the story beyond our own region of how important we are because people don't realize it. The people I've talked to in this region were shocked by some of the numbers uh, that, 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 that we were able to put together. And if you stop and think about it, because representation is based on population, not economic significance, we have about we have about 2% of, of, of the population of Texas, which means we have about 2% of the legislators in Texas, yet we're 10 percent or more of economic contribution to the state economy. So we're not getting our, our proportional representation. If you throw in New Mexico, we've got three congressmen out of 450 uh, that, that represent the Permian Basin, so it's less than 1 percent. So you can begin to see very quickly that, that we're going to be underrepresented given our relative importance uh, in the absence of making sure that word gets out there. That was a very important theme. And so the study tried to make both of those cases, the case that we're not the 80s and the case that, that, that we're a very, very important part of the economy. And, uh, and I'll, I want to kind of walk through that. So, so whoever, as, again, I won't spend a lot of time on the slides, but whoever's running the slides, you can go ahead and throw the next one up there. I hope that's not me. <laughs> right, perfect, perfect, right. Uh, and this just makes that basic point that, that it's very important that we do some things now that set the stage for the future uh, and, and all the great initiatives that are going on and all the things that are going to happen. And, and, and so this is just making that point that we are very important and, and one of the top and probably the top, but I'll say the oil producing region uh, in the world. And so you can go into the next one at this point. Next slide. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. Perfect. <clears throat> and, this, and this one just makes the point of today how important we are we are about 10 percent of the texas economy let me focus on i was i was looking at some of these numbers earlier today and i'm always trying to think about different ways to say things if you look at those numbers over on the left that 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 we we bring about 163 billion dollars in gross product to the state each year and everything we contribute to which includes the pipelines and and the refiners the shippers and everybody else but all of it that only happens because of permian basin oil not oil in general but just permian basin oil responsible for about 1.4 million jobs. If our forecast for Texas, which maybe maybe uh, from what we can tell now, it looks like it'll be fairly close for this year, but our forecast for Texas for this year, given everything that happens, is showing a loss of about 800 or about 900,000 jobs and about $130 billion in gross product year over year when all things are, are uh, considered. So one way to look at, at, at our region is Texas would be better off with a permanent pandemic than it would be uh, without the without the permanent basin. And that the oil and gas industry. I, didn't, I think that's a fairly concise statement of how important we are. I mean, literally, if, if it weren't for the permanent basin, 
<clears throat> we would have less economic activity than we're having right now in the middle of a pandemic all the time. And so I, 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 to me, that was a fairly compelling way to, uh, uh, to say that and look at it. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next one. And, and these, I'm, I'm just going to go through them fairly quickly. What we did was look at what, what we contribute to the economy in a typical year in the future, between now and 2030, under a variety of different oil price assumptions. And, uh, and if you take the baseline and the very low one, which is the 25 to $35 a barrel uh, range, I have to say that the day I put this together, my very low, the very the price of oil was about $4 a barrel. So my very low range sounded pretty high at that point. But realistically, it takes something in that range, it closed around 34 today. It takes something in that range to even have a sustainable market long term. You can have these freaky things that happen with the traders and that sort of thing, which we kind of saw that one coming. But, but, uh, but day in and day out, that would be like the very lowest range and, and obviously not where I think it would be. We gave it a very low probability. But the difference to me is, is significant. The difference in, in, what we call our baseline assumptions of oil prices of $224 billion a year, $1.7 billion jobs almost, versus that very low one, which comes out to less than 800,000 jobs. Again, you're looking at a difference there of about 900,000 jobs, which is about what we think we're going to lose in Texas this year from the pandemic. So just the difference in this, this recent situation and, and a baseline situation is very, very important. And, and so that's, I want to make that point because again, that, that gives an idea of why it's important to have a stable, sustainable uh, domestic oil market. And, and, and it gives us part of the story that we need to tell. Uh, you can go ahead to the next one. New slide. Yeah, yeah new slide's fine. <clears throat> this one just talks about the fiscal benefits uh, <clears throat> through 2030. Uh, we think that, that uh, the area, and I've got to, in fact, go to the next one because these numbers are also on the next slide. And uh, this this just compares all of them, but the baseline numbers are the same. Uh, that we, over the next through 2030, we'll contribute something like 120 billion dollars to state governments, almost 90 billion to local governments around the state, and almost half a trillion dollars to the federal government. I mean, the, again, these are enormous numbers, and if you compare those to the numbers that that, that we get when we look at the low oil price scenario, then then they're less than half that. But so again, it's just part of the story we have to tell. I mean, there's no other place our size, representing just half a million in particular population, roughly the entire permanent basin, that can make a statement like they were responsible for half a trillion dollars in federal revenue or over a two period. No one can come close to that. And that's the message that's, that's not getting out there. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next one. Uh, these are just predicting projecting the losses in, in, in the U.S. and Texas as we think year over year. And it's important to say year over year because, uh, because like, for example, we're calling for a loss of 9.8 million jobs in the U.S. Well, it's down 20 million this last month, but it was up in January and February, and we think it'll be starting up again in the summer. And, and, and so these are annual averages, 1920, 2019 over 2020. So, so that's why the numbers are, are, uh, are, Enormous, but not as big as the numbers we're seeing right now due to the worst of it. And similarly, as I mentioned, the numbers in Texas, which again are less than what the permanent basin represents for the Texas economy. Uh, you can go to the next one uh, as, as well. Um, the permanent basin is interesting because we're talking about 35,000 jobs, and again, that's year over year 36,000 jobs. Right now, it's the, the data for the rural counties is fairly dicey, particularly those that had a fair amount of drilling activity going on. but it's probably three times that in the short term, maybe somewhere around 100,000 jobs that we're probably down right now. That's on a base of 250,000, and that's a 40% drop. Now, it's only temporary, and, but, but you can begin to see the enormity of this and, and, and what it means to us. And of course, Odessa is a, is a major hub in the service side of this, and so it, it, it picks up a fair number of those jobs, not as much of the output, because most of the output comes from the value of the oil and gas itself. And of course, uh, we're not producing a whole lot of that in extra county right now. So, so the numbers here are a little bit lower in terms of gross product, but significantly the service jobs and then all the spinoff jobs of the people in smaller counties who come here to do shopping and that sort of thing. So the job loss, we're going to put a pretty good check of it, but, uh, but the output loss are considerably less. Uh, moving on. Okay, this, is, this is one that I added after. Literally, uh, when, when the slideshow didn't work, 
over at ODT the other day. For some reason, I got off on this. I'm not sure why. And, and I started talking about it. It seemed to be the thing everybody was talking about afterwards. So we added this slide. I've since written a statewide column about it. And, and But I think it's a very, very important message that that, that, uh, that we need to think about here. And that's just how different this situation is than the 1980s were, because that was, of course, the old bus that brought us our previous high unemployment in the state and many other hardships. But that one started down in 1982 and didn't reach the, the, the low point until 1986. Uh, this one happened in a matter of weeks. Uh, to give you another perspective, in that one, in 1982, the first year, the price only dropped a dollar a barrel. The problem was we had an expectation built in that was going to go up about $10 a barrel. But the price only dropped a dollar in 1982. It didn't collapse until 1986. And yet we went into a massive shutdown and recession. Uh, <clears throat> and then the sheer magnitude this time around is also significant. The demand for oil in the world dropped 25% in a month. And that's something that it literally, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, and you can't even conceive of numbers like that. Because the only way it can happen is if you just shut everything down. Uh, which in by and large we did. And obviously that will start to come back fairly quickly as the time it recovers. Production is shutting back. So when we get back even half of what we lost, you'll see the oil market start being fairly normal again. And so that's a very important thing. The other thing was the surrounding environment. Uh, as we started this, we were in the middle of the longest economic expansion in the history of the country. And you know, there's always problems in the economy, but nothing major. I mean, there were no major structural things going on. Go back to the 80s, we had the savings and loan crisis. You know, half, the, half the banks and all the savings and loans uh, in the country had to be uh, restructured in some, some way at that time. The real estate crisis, which created billions of dollars in losses, changes in tax policy, which managed to, to uh, wreak havoc on things, uh, and also a lot of policy things going on in the Cold War with us trying to use oil. To bring down the, the old Soviet Union. There's just a lot of a lot of noise going on at that time that we didn't that we don't have right now. And then uh, if you also look at the at the one in the eighties, of course it came right after the seventies, which is what we out here in West Texas call the oil boom, and the rest of the world called the energy crisis. But but if you go back to the seventies, that was when people were turning down their thermostats. We went to daylight savings time. We, we banned oil exports. All of these things. And so demand was very sluggish. This time around, we've got a global economy that's emerging. Half the world is going into the manufacturing revolution. And demand was very solid and growing very rapidly. And will again once we get through this. So it's a very different situation. Another very important difference. Uh, when that one started, we were in the middle of what became a 35-year decline in oil production. In the basin. We were running out of oil and running out of reserves. We went from 2.2 million barrels a day to 700,000 barrels a day between 1973 and 2008. This is kind of in the middle of that time period. And it didn't start, and, and of course, after 2008, it came back. We're now in a situation where we're producing twice prior to, prior to the very, very recent times. We're producing twice that previous record with literally centuries of reserves out there. Costs are falling rapidly. It's a, a different technological world. A lot of things are very different, and we're in, in, a, in a period of, of growth in the industry instead of a period that was already one of decline even before the 80s began, which is we, the price had gone up enough to kind of mask it. But the reality was we were producing less oil and having less reserves every year. And then one that's kind of a weird inside baseball thing that's very important, and that is uh, that in the 80s, most of it was, was financed with bank debt. And this time around, a lot of it was equity capital because this all started around 2008, right after the real estate bust uh, and, the, and, and the mortgage crisis. People were kind of soured on Wall Street, soured on real estate, soured on a lot of investments. So a lot of equity capital went into the oil and gas sector just to be shell plays for coming online. What that means is you have some flexibility. Uh, with, with institutional debt, uh, particularly with highly regular, highly regulated entities, you don't have a lot of flexibility. That is, you pretty much have to hit your numbers every quarter or, or you're going to be in trouble. And with, 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 with equity, you have more flexibility. And that's why we can really see a dollar drop in the price of oil practically shut things down. Then you can have a $10, $15, $20 drop now and people don't even slow down drilling at all. So it's, it's a very different environment. And that's the story we need to tell locally to some of our businesses, but particularly to our workers. It's like, don't pack up and leave. 
<laughs> because somebody says this feels like the 80s. Because this is a very, very different situation. And, that, and I spent a lot of time on that slide, but I think it's a, a very, very important point. Um, we can move on from there. Uh, the next thing was just the things that we recommended. Again, uh, a lot of these were already underway, and a lot of them people are engaging in very quickly. Uh, the task force has already been, been formed. Uh, David Bhutan is chairing it. I think there's a piece of it folks specifically on this advocacy thing that I talked about that, that Kirk Edwards is going to head up. There's been a lot of activity already taking place there. There are programs going around to help local businesses, to help local families. Uh, a lot of this is going on to provide information uh, for, um, to, to, to folks locally on assistance and that sort of thing. The other one I just talked about was the information campaign for the for local community, and particularly our local workers. And then the one sort of infrastructure thing that we put in here short term, obviously, there's going to be a lot of things considered by Opportunity you know, Odessa and other groups that can look beyond this crisis is, is universal broadband. <clears throat> because it has become very, very apparent that, um, that, uh, that we need that. It's, it's imperative for the schools as they try to reach everyone in a difficult time. It's imperative for businesses, including oil and gas businesses, who are having to do more with their operations remotely. It's going to become one of those things that's going to be a check mark that you have to get checked, the box you have to check before anybody will look at you for a site selection in the future. So it, it's a very, very important. Uh, some, some of you know, I was on one of the state task forces and I was in charge of writing the economic development section. And I, this is one of the things I put in there that has been adopted by the group. They didn't, they didn't take my, my interstate highway through here, my, my north south interstate highway through the year. They, they, they kicked that one out, but they didn't keep the broadband. So, but you can't blame, you can't blame a guy for trying, you know. And, and then, obviously, and then the other one, of course, is the thing I talked about earlier, the advocacy campaign. And, and that's it. There's a concluding slide, uh, but, but that's basically, uh, what we came up with in the study. But I think the two messages that, that are very, very important that come out of this is that we we have to convince folks locally about what's different this time and why it's going to be different this time, even though it feels really bad. And there's no way to, to get around how bad it is, how bad it feels. And the second one is we've got to explain to the country and, and in Austin and Washington why this area is so important for resources to be allocated. Uh, because we have not received what we should have out here. When you go into Washington, you face all the talk about some of the climate issues and that sort of thing. And there's, there's some of that. And some of them, you know, I have the audacity to think that our area might have been a little arrogant at some points in time when things were going very well. I don't know where they could get that idea, but they kind of do. And so we kind of come in with a little bit of a negative impression that three, three members of Congress are not going to be able to overcome. It's going to take an aggressive effort uh, of advocacy and marketing to do that. And, and even in Austin, we're not getting the support we should be getting. And so those are the, those, those are the things we really came up with. I think the last slide is, and this is obviously the concluding slide basically says what I just said. And then there's one more slide. I think it's just a commercial. And, uh, um, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I won't say anything about that. I'll just say we're pretty good and <laughs> fat. So, uh, <laughs> so, so that's, that, that, that's what I came up with. And, and it was a privilege to work on this and to be involved in it. And, and get the support throughout. I thank ODC for, for uh, giving us the opportunity to do this and be happy to answer any questions and talk about anything you want to talk about on this subject or others. The uh, uh, ahead, report is really, it's very compelling. And I, I imagine most of the council, if not all, have read it, but there is a lot of great information in, in uh, this Perryman report that was prepared. Are there any questions, uh, Gray? I've got a comment, if I could, Peggy. First, Dr. Perryman, thank you so much for all you do for the city and the county and the, the state. We just appreciate it so much. I cannot tell you enough, though, how important the education part is. I, I, I enjoyed your article in Sunday's paper so much. It just hit home so well that this is not the 80s and we've got to educate not only our community but this wonderful state that uh, this is not doom and gloom we do have a bright rainbow at the end of this all in fact i hope you don't mind i sent this report to the commissioner and, and he said thank you and he wanted me to tell you hi so <laughs> I start, 
Dewey, I've probably seen it to, I've probably seen it to him as well because I had a big blast today. <laughs> so, and I'm pretty sure Charles is on my list. I also said it to every member of the legislature and every member of the Texas delegation of Congress. So, so but, but, but it is a, it's a very, very important message that, that needs to get out there. It does. That, that one page that you just included is, is so important. If you get a chance, send it to me because I, I sure want to do the same thing and get it all the way across to all the, all the other regulators that we have and let them know that, hey, we're going to move forward with this thing pretty quickly. So thank you, Dr. Freeman, very much. I don't know that we have these slides, but I agree with Dewey. If we don't, if you could send those to Michael or any one of us, we can share them because uh, they're, they're very concise and they have exactly what we all need to have committed to memory and be able to speak about. I'll be happy to do that, obviously. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. I think Michael already has them. I think he's the one to put them up today. Yes, I, I can certainly send them out to the council. Okay. Right. Right. Thanks. Peggy, right. hey, uh, this is Wesley. I don't know if I can talk for just one second. Sure. I just want to let you know that uh, David, as Dr. Perryman said, is, is the liaison between ODC and uh, this report basically, and we're moving on it extremely fast. We're meeting tomorrow at 4 30 with Kirk Edwards and his group that he's, uh, uh, thrown out some names. We've already got someone, uh, working with, uh, CVA advertising, who is the contractor for marketing for ODC to get the message out, uh, all the way across, uh, locally state and nationally. Uh, so it's gonna, it's gonna start hitting home very, very quickly. And we've unpaused the opportunity Odessa group and their meeting as well tomorrow as the large group, uh, that was paused when all this started. So all the wheels are starting to turn again. And I think we're going to see some really great things, but it's been a pleasure to, uh, uh, to work with Dr. Perryman, of course, and he's done a great job. So I uh, just want to say thank you as well to everybody that's allowed us to do that. Good job. If, I, if I could add one thing to that, uh, Peggy, uh, the, um, with the Optino Odessa group, the the things that they're focused on are obviously more long term housing, infrastructure, things like that. And, and and obviously we have these short term issues we need to deal with right now. Uh the group that's that's working with the group, we've agreed to contribute all the all the data that we that, that we did over in priority member. We're gonna do all of that here pro bono for, for Odessa as part of that whole analysis. But the, but the point is it's time to get that conversation started again because all of those issues are gonna be on top of us very soon. It's not like it's years and years and years until this hits us. I mean, we've got to get 50% of the world order man back, and that's not going to take very long. Right. Okay. Any any other comments, questions for Dr. Perryman or for Wes? Okay. Thank you both very much. And we really appreciate it, Ray. I know you've given this presentation. I don't know what was in your contract to give it, but I'm sure you've given it more times than that. So well, I, I tell you, I tell you what, if, if you didn't, if you didn't get enough today, I'm doing, I, I'm doing the chamber board tomorrow. I'm doing the opportunity Odessa tomorrow. And, and then on Thursday, I'm doing the Permian Basin coalition. So if you missed it today, <laughs> there's plenty of opportunities. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Norma, do we need a motion to remove number E from the consent agenda? Hello? Make a motion. I do believe we do, Peggy. I'll make a motion to remove number E. Yeah. Second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, so number E is moved from the consent agenda. Uh, do we have any comments or concerns on the consent agenda? If not, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Okay, the consent agenda is, is approved and we'll now discuss number E, consider the purchase for the roll-off truck for solid waste for a Hundred and ninety-nine thousand five ninety-three, Philip. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening, uh, Council Mayor Pro Tem. I wanted to uh, present this agenda item for the purchase of a roll-off truck from the U.S. Communities Purchasing Cooperative uh, vendor, which is Big Truck Rental. 
as uh, as was stated, he purchased one hundred ninety nine thousand five hundred ninety three dollars. This truck would go to replace a unit that was totaled in 2019, and the city received insurance disbursements in the amount of $129,900. The remaining balance will be paid out of the equipment services capital uh, replacement account. There is still funding in there in the amount of $2.4 million uh, for this unit. Uh, this unit uh, is also needed due to another unit uh, that is down and it's solid waste due to mechanical issues. So the, the department is budgeted for six units and they are currently operating on four. Uh, this is a Peterbilt 567 truck with a, uh, a Galbraith body. And we do run uh, at this time only Heil and Galbraith bodies on our roll offs. And that is the reason for the purchase of the Galbraith. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, I think that's. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Philip, I have a question. Is U.S. Communities purchasing? Is that the buy board? No, no sir. It's a it's a similar uh, contract like buy board. There's several purchasing cooperatives that are out there. Is this truck sitting on the ground? It is sitting on the ground. Yes, sir. So it's it's maybe a time issue. The reason I ask is it looks like we're buying a truck from Peterbilt of Baltimore, and yes. and we have several good dealerships in the in the Permian Basin that we can yes, be sir. buying trucks from. Yes, sir. And uh, I do make it a, a goal uh, to uh, to take care of our local folks. Uh, and we have purchased quite a bit from our local uh, Peterbilt dealership. Uh, we did talk to them about a the purchase of a roll off and they were able to quote a, uh, a G and H roll off body, which we do not currently have that brand in our fleet. Uh, it would be a um, uh, I guess a maintenance issue for our folks to have to learn a, a new truck. But beyond that, they had a lead time uh, on, on getting this truck to us. And this truck is sitting on the ground at this point. Okay. All right. Well, that, uh, that was the only reason I'd think that we would have chosen this one is that it's readily available. And, and I, I assume it's sorely needed. Yes, sir. It definitely is needed. Uh, being two trucks down is, uh, is definitely hurting the, the solid waste department. It is needed. Yes, sir. What it, what is the lead time? Uh, so, in talking with the the, the sales gentleman uh, from Big Truck, uh, the, the the vendor that's on this contract, as soon as we get him a PO, he can have it to us within a week. Uh, in working with the local uh, uh, Peterbilt dealership, which is the Rush Truck Center, uh, in previous builds we've had with them, it takes up to six months to get a truck. Yeah. Well, I don't think Peterbilt's not that far behind today, but I, I didn't know what Galbraiths backlog was either okay yes sir. It, it is definitely, yes sir any other questions of philip okay i'd entertain a motion for number e so move second. second okay all those in favor say aye aye aye, aye. opposed okay the motion passes thank you philip uh, the next action item uh, is to consider Carlo Flores' facade grant on 513 North Grant. Uh, LaWanda, do you have something to tell us about that? Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Thank you for your time this evening. I look forward to a time where we can all be together again. So do we. I believe it. So, and I believe Ms. Flores is also on the line with us this evening. She is the owner of the building. We are looking at 513 North Grant Avenue. And here we go. Just a quick tier reminder for you guys. Tier one is 100% of available funds and facade grant is 25,000. So when you're looking at tier one, imagine you're standing in the center of fifth and grant and go out two blocks in each direction. That gives you up to 100% of the available funds. If you take a block, a step of a block out in each direction from tier one, you find yourself in tier two, which is availability of up to 75% of the available funds. One more block out in each direction puts you in tier three, 50% of the available funds. And if you'll see the rest of what's left inside the green line, you find yourself in tier four, and that is up to 25% of the available funds. Luana, 13, yes. Um, are you um, presenting something? Because there's nothing on the screen. Nothing on yes, the screen. Sir. Oh, 
Let's see here. Can't see nothing. I have it up, Lawana, if you need my help. Go for it. Okay. Give me just a second, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. There it is. Okay. Keep going, Miss Devin. Go ahead and advance it. It's going just a little bit slow because it's also recording, so just bear with me, please. And this is the one, Devin. Okay. So 513 North Grant, as you can see the red dot inside the red square is in tier one. That's up to 100% of the available funds. Again, that availability is $25,000. Go ahead, Devin. This is what the building currently looks like once that populates up. There we go. Without, without the signage, that is the old painted poppy. And to the left on that picture, you can kind of see the sign that said Coast 101. After that was French Press Cafe. After that was uh, Cool Blue. On the right is the, uh, the grant venue. So this is a proposal. Go ahead, Ms. Devin. There you have it, the new image for 513 North Grant. It is absolutely beautiful. It is well within the requirements set forth for the overlay zone in downtown and for any of the um, recipients of a facade grant. Go ahead, Devin. I'm gonna keep talking while these change. If you look at the use of elements, you have stone, you have brick, you have mortar, you have glass. Go ahead, Devin. And then the awning is within the specifications, eight foot tall, five foot out. Absolutely beautiful rendering what we've done here. When you think back to what the old design committee came up with as far as the, um, the urban contemporary feel, it fits that as well. Go ahead. Looking at the money aspect of it, you're looking at a total investment of $46,560. They are asking for the full $25,000 facade grant reimbursement. And that leaves their portion. If you'll remember your facade grants are 80-20, 80% reimbursement, 20% um, uh, business uh, skin in the game, if you will. They are well over that at 21,560. They're really invested into downtown and are excited about the growth that's happening. Go ahead, Devin. And if you'd like to see how this investment breaks down, we have it here. You're looking at demolition, framing, awning, stucco, limestone, tile, storefront, electrical, miscellaneous, labor, and supervision, again, for a grand total of 46560 Ms. Flores and her husband purchased this property and they do desire to be an active part of the revitalization. And their first step in this effort is through the enhancement of this building's facade. Now their plan is to rent out this property to a local business owner once this facade has been completed. They do have a tenant in mind, a gentleman who's very excited to get started, he's already has their business plan ready to go, submitted it to them and he's ready to move in and get started yesterday. So one thing I can tell you about this, I know there have been some questions and that is that it will be a um, bar restaurant type of facility. At this point in time, that's the tenant they're looking at. As far as the facade agreement, it's a 12 month completion request and that the owner estimates that should happen well within the time frame. This was approved by the Odessa um, Design Committee on March 24th. It was approved by ODC a week and a half ago and hopefully we'll get your approval tonight. Do you guys have any questions for me? Are there any questions for Luana? You go ahead, Devin. I move for approval. Woohoo! Yeah, I hear that. 
Well, that's in favor of the Carla Flores facade grant at 513 North Grant. Please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, Devin. The motion passes. Thank you, Lafana, and thank you, Mrs. Ford. Welcome to downtown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next on our agenda is the resolution. Uh, consider a resolution of support urging the Texas Department of Transportation to include all routes as part of its study of the extension of I-27 towards the Plains. In particular, the areas considered in the original analysis of the Lubbock to I-10 study conducted from 1993 to 1997. The economic impact and population growth of the areas in Odessa Midland is significant and should be a leading consideration of any study. I think we have James with us tonight. Are you with us, James? That's correct. I am. Okay. Uh, so you want to go ahead and uh, talk to us a little bit about this and explain this resolution? In 1993, TxDOT began a study of the extension of I-27 uh, from Lubbock to I-10. Since that time and the completion of that study in 1997, uh, the Ports to Plains corridor, which is the US-87 uh, corridor and 277 that goes down from Lubbock to Big Spring to San Angelo, Del Rio, and then on to uh, Laredo, has had nine additional studies focused solely at their route or that designated Ports to Plains route. And uh, we certainly have always thought that it should go another way. Uh, but most recently, we've probably been more concerned on I-14 and bringing it to Midland and Odessa. During the last legislative session, the Texas legislature passed a study that was specifically to look at the extension of I-27 along the designated Ports to Plains corridor and did not consider all their uh, all the other alternatives. And that's the reason that we're coming to you with this resolution today. The interim study uh, that has come out, and it's no Dr. Ray Perryman report, but it does provide a very uh, positive view of extending it along the Ports to Plains corridor. Keep in mind that that actual corridor only consists of 27 counties and the entire study area consists of 69. So it's utilizing data from 42 counties that are off that corridor. To put it long and short, whether you're looking at employment, labor income, population, or GDP, the majority of the economic case for that route comes from Odessa and Midland. As such, there are a couple things that we're asking in this resolution. Number one is that routes that come to Midland and Odessa, and that's primarily the Midland leg that was added to Ports to Plains. Uh, those projects were deprioritized in the study in favor of 87 and 277 improvements. So number one, if you're going to derive your economic benefit and justification in this study uh, from a route that gets you to the Midland and Odessa area, that ought to be a priority for improvement. Secondly, is the fact that when you look at the lion's share of the economic benefit shown in this study, deriving from Midland and Odessa, and just to put that in perspective, 60% uh, of the entire population growth uh, along the entire study route, all 69 counties and 68% of it just in segment two, all derived out of Odessa and Midland. That being the case, we feel it's imperative that this study be part of a larger effort that will include looking at all the routes to Midland and Odessa, and particularly bring in the US 385 route. Uh, that's also a very positive route and look at that going forward. And the uh, the impetus of this is just based on our running of the numbers in their economic report using their model, if you can achieve 70 to 80% of the economic benefit at a third of the cost of what they're suggesting by simply extending I-27 from Lubbock to the Odessa Midland area. 
we feel like that ought to be a priority. And that's what we're really asking for in this resolution. Okay. And I think, uh, James, you had explained to us in Motran that uh, what we're basically asking them to do is just to expand, use the same model, but expand it to include us uh, because it, the results are kind of irrefutable. Councilwoman Dean, if they would use this same economic model, uh, they would have built I-35 to Odessa Midland and not to Dallas. So we, we would definitely like them to use this same model and to use it again for a lot of our projects out here, uh, this one included. Okay, great. Uh, are there any questions of James? I know transportation is always kind of complicated to us and especially when we're trying to understand something that we're not really, but this resolution basically is, uh, is a resolution for support and asking for them to to consider changing their original analysis. Um, are there any questions of James? Clarifications? James, this is Dewey, and I do appreciate all the hard work you're doing to get this done. I guess my question more than anything is, how will we do besides this resolution to persuade them in the cost? I mean, it's been overlooked for so many years that how do you jump up and yell and everything else to make sure this happens. Well, you know, Councilman Bright, we've done a lot better the last few years, so we're making progress. And a little bit of that goes back to what Dr. Perryman talked about earlier. And I call it telling the story of the Permian Basin and our economic impact, uh, connecting population, freight, those sorts of things. And we also have a freight study going on. so. Uh, that's really detailing what our traffic flows and patterns are uh, throughout the area. So it's a little bit of all of those things. What we want to make sure in this, though, is that uh, we don't just have a study showing a rosy, wonderful outlook for a very particular corridor going from Lubbock to Laredo uh, that, that doesn't look at those other corridors and break down uh, that data. And part of the, the reason that I'm not too, too terribly concerned about it is that number one, the cost for this corridor as it's defined uh, in their current study would be about $24 billion. And that's $24 billion that they don't have. So I don't necessarily think that this is imminent. However, that being said, the reason I do take it very seriously, about two years ago, the Texas Department of Transportation came back and said, you know, we've been working so hard for the Permian Basin. We've spent $3 billion out here over the last five years. And when we ran those numbers, what we found was that 62% of all new funds and 47% of all construction funds that they included in that were spent on the Ports to Plains corridor. And that really doesn't address the needs of the Permian Basin. What we found at TxDOT is the things that they study and study and study over and over again are the things that they end up building. And so part of our analysis to this is to go back, pull all of that economic data, make them look at these other routes. And I think once we do that, uh, we'll be in good shape because we can compete on the economics, uh, but we've got, to, we've got to be in the game. And that's part of why we're asking them to add those additional routes for study. Well, great. I, I'm all behind you, I appreciate it. And be wonderful to have it. I know y'all worked hard. We just need to, we need to make it happen. Uh, I, I think too, James, um, I don't think council has seen the little map, you know, the map showing those different interstates. We might get those out to council too, just for their understanding. Okay, absolutely. That was a good presentation that you showed us at Motram. Okay, are there any other questions? I okay. move for approval to support this uh, resolution. Do I hear a second? Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, so the motion to uh, consent to for the support this of this resolution is passed then. James, we'll get that to you. I think you wanted it to send with all of your information, right? 
You bet. We appreciate it and we'll get it done. Thank you. Thank you for your tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, the next item on our agenda is to consider to deny on course requested rate change. Philip? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Encore has filed an application with all cities within its service area that retain jurisdiction to increase rates to its customers. Encore is seeking to increase rates by approximately $75.8 million annually. The last increase was sought and approved in 2019 for $29.4 million system wide. This would be Encore's third filing under a law adopted in 2011 that allows electric utilities to file increase, increased cases. Uh, because the city is a member of the Encore City Steering Committee, the committee is recommending that uh, the city deny the rate increase and hire uh, an outside consultant to review the rate filing. The outside consultant would be uh, Lloyd Gosling's uh, attorney, uh, attorneys, and they have uh, worked with the city before, especially with, uh, with both Atmos and Encore. Uh, this is uh, something that if the council does approve that this would deny uh, Encore's requested rate case and bring on these consultants to uh, review the filing and negotiate uh, any increase that may come. And being a member of this board representing the city, this is something that you're suggesting that we do, right? Correct. Yes, ma'am. Are there any questions of Philip regarding this uh, requested rate change? Is this attorney, does he represent the, the uh, coalition or just the city of Odessa? No, sir. He represents the, the steering committee or the coalition. Sorry, say that again. No, no, sir. He he represents the steering committee, the committee as a whole. Okay. Does this need a motion to deny this? Yes, ma'am. And it's a resolution for your approval. Okay. Any other so, questions? So moved. A second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so the motion to deny on course requested rate change is passed. Okay, Norma, uh, do we have any appointment of boards? No, we do not. Okay. Uh, are there any citizen comments on non agenda items? No, we do not have any. Then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Adjourn. Thank you all. Thank you. Welcome. Good job, Peggy. Thank Good you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.